Hello everybody and welcome to episode 60 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A. As always, we'll be answering the questions that you guys have sent through. Last week, Jerry was hosting the episode, episode 59. I'll be hosting this particular episode and then next week, Jerry and myself will be co-hosting again. So, yeah, let's get straight into it. Um, thank you so much for sending your questions through. Question one, coming up. Of the two lodges you have recently been to, which do you prefer? Okay, Roxy, thank you so much for sending your question through. And I, I know this question came when we were at Simbambili and Saseka. Obviously, with a bit of the um, connectivity being a bit of an issue, we couldn't get to this question on that particular episode. But to answer your question, um, it's a tough one. I think the, the, the game viewing in both areas was really, really good, even though... It is the green season, it is the rainy season, and the bush is generally quite thick this time of the year. From a lodge point of view, uh, that's a tough one. I think it's a seca, just the, the, the size of the main area and the rooms is really inc incredible. But I think Simambili, what I really enjoyed about it is the, the getaway fireplaces. It's something that I really enjoy doing and it's something that I encourage my guests to do is to sit around the fire either before or after dinner and just you know start chatting stories that you can tell around the fire i think is is really cool but if i had to choose one of them i will go overall simbambili and i think that might shock a lot of people because the rooms at the seca really are amazing and so is the the main area but there, there's something about that just that bush feel that I really enjoyed about Simambili. So that would be my choice between the two. How much difference is there, if any, from a wildlife point of view between the lodges or the areas? Okay, yeah, Mary, um, I think, you know, like I said in the, in the previous, uh, with the previous question, I think the difference, Simambili is more, it's, a, it's got a bush feel with a bit of finesse, whereas Saseka is just pure class. I think from a from a lodge point of view, it is very different, which which I really enjoyed. Very light colors, very modern, and you know, massive like these stretchy tents. So almost like an East African feel with um, with a bit of a twist, with a bit of a, like a luxury twist, if you can call it that. Um, the areas themselves, from a game viewing point of view, I don't think there's there's too much of a difference. However, I think from a, from a predator point of view in Simambili was just incredible. The interaction between predators, I don't think I've ever seen so many spotted hyenas anywhere, you know, including the Masamara and Serengeti. So we were very, very fortunate. I mean, we only spent two nights at each, so we literally had four game drives at each lodge. So it is quite difficult to, to give like a, a true reflection of the properties in such a short space of time. But I think you know, that's where it works quite well if you combine the two. I think combining both lodges, doing Simbambili first, and then finishing at Saseka because of the, the luxury and things that you get from a lodge point of view, I think is great. And I think that's where the Thorny Bush um, group really have it. Um, they, they've really done it right. You know, having that combination for people, it's a very easy road transfer between the two lodges, but you can also fly between the two as well, which is a great option. What's your opinion on wildlife photographers posting general portraits and not writing anywhere in the caption or any hashtags what the animal is? Dan, thank you so much for your question. Um, I do agree with you. I think it's, especially if it's something that's out of the ordinary, you know, um, like birds that people might not know what it is or a unique animal only found in a certain area, then 100% I think... You know, to, to raise awareness about these particular animals is, is a key part of posting on social media. And we always say you either got to entertain or educate people when you post anything on social media. And I think that's where it comes qu quite important. You know, I think it also depends the kind of story that you want to portray. You know, if you are trying to create awareness about a particular animal that might be endangered, then absolutely, you know, like state what animal it is. And also, you know, if there's any sort of organizations that people can become a part of, then include that in there as well. I think we also, you know, as, um, what do you call it, like a social media absorbers, if you want to call it that, to our engagement has to be a bit different. I think a lot of the time it's just a, like a thumbs up or 
love this image, but we don't always ask the questions. And the same goes for people that jump to conclusions when they, when they view a particular video or a photograph. I think people are often very quick to hide behind their keyboards and, and jump straight to a conclusion without asking that photographer the right questions. You know, what led up to the situation, if it was portrayed as being something negative, um, but also, you know, ask questions about how that photographer got that particular image. I think this way the engagement becomes a lot better. You might maybe learn a thing or two, and it also it just makes for good conversation. So I think, Dan, to answer your question, I think it has to come from, from both sides. I think absolutely when you, um, when you post an image, you know, try and put as much information as possible, but also, you know, try and answer or ask the right questions to that particular photographer or person that you're following. Ambuseli has a handful of big tuskers. Places like Mana Pools, the Ellies have lost their tusks or they're quite small due to poaching. Did all the Ellies in Africa originally have big tusks or is tusk size a regional or diet thing? Linda, I absolutely love this question. I think this is one of the best questions we've had in a very, very, very long time. Now, I'm by no means saying that what I'm going to answer is the right and only answer and I'm happy to if you guys are watching this please leave your comments down at the bottom and let's have a conversation about this but I had a conversation with a, a very well-known um, guide in the industry quite a few years ago and it was believed that elephants a long time ago I'm talking about 100 200 years ago were much larger than what they are now everything about them the feet the body the height and their tusks I do believe that hunting and poaching, I'm talking about trophy hunting and poaching definitely has had an impact on the size, definitely the size of their tusks, but possibly even the sizes of their bodies as well. So animals have, have adapted 100%. Every single animal that you can almost think of has adapted sort of in the last 100 to 200 years. And the, the, the big tuskers, did all of the elephants in Africa have big tusks? I think bigger than what they have now. And you mentioned that, you know, elephants in Mana Pools and, you know, probably like South of the Wangwa and those areas have smaller tusks than Ambuseli, for example. And for me personally, I put it down to, to two things. Diet is definitely one of them. And also the surrounding areas, the, the, um, the vegetation. That they find themselves in. So if you think of a place like, let's take Monopools for example, right? The, the tusks, that's used as a, like a defense mechanism, but also to, to break off pieces of bark for them. So the bark carries a lot of nutrition, which obviously love during the dry season. But as they strip off this bark, pieces of their tusks can break off. Take, compare that to an area like Ambuseli, for example, those elephants would generally feed around that sort of wetland marsh area. So they'll be taking in a lot of grass and not really as much bark as, like I mentioned, like mana pools or Kruger, for example. Also to um, the, the vegetation, imagine an elephant like, um, what's the elephant in Ambuseli, like Tim or Craig, whoever it is, with those massive tusks, now trying to move in a thick area like mana pools or Medikwe, for example. His tusks are going to be stuck sort of around every single corner. Um, <clears throat> I think I can't remember which elephant it was. I think it was Tim or Craig, but they actually had to cut his tusks down a bit because he was literally plying the ground as he was walking. Now, Ambuseli is quite an open area, right? So already, like even with an open area, he was having difficulty in moving around. So you can imagine in a dense area, that movement of those big, big tusks would be quite limited. Um, I do agree 100% that the tusks, as an average overall throughout Africa, elephants have definitely, um, the tusks definitely have shortened. And you even find some elephants, especially cows, being born without tusks. Um, I know there, there, there's a study on lions that they did as well. Lions in the, the South Luangwa Valley compared to like Masamara or the Kalahari, where the lions in the, the, the valley have lot smaller manes. And this is also, again, you know, because of the vegetation, a lot of dense thickets, especially along the river, whereas in the Masa Mara, you know, they've got wide open plains, so they can have those bigger mains. That's a theory. That's what I believe. 
and like I mentioned, if you guys, if you know of anyone or you want to sort of discuss this, we can even run a podcast. I think it will make for great conversation to have a bunch of guides around the table to discuss this. Please let me know. My email will be at the end of this episode and let's discuss this further. As a reminder for everyone, why did we change our logo? Okay, so this is quite cool. I did ask some of the office team to also send through uh, some questions because, um, you know, there, there might be some interesting questions that we touched on that we haven't in previous episodes. To answer the question about why we changed our logo, I think, as everyone knows, the whole world has, has changed dramatically over the last year. And th this was the perfect opportunity for us as well that to, to also change the way that we see the world, to, to change our logo to bring something new, something different to the table. And I think we, we've really lived that change so far during the last, however long it's been that we've had the new logo. I think it's five or six months, something like that. Um, the introduction of Wild Eye TV, which we'll be sharing more with you guys in the future. So I think th that this sort of, although it's been a very, very difficult time for everyone, especially in the travel industry, I think it's been a very positive change from our side and to almost sort of have it as a as a new beginning bring something modern to the table from a from a logo point of view but also to for us to think outside the box during this difficult time i think we've, we've shown that with a lot of the online tuition that we've done and the the webinars and like i mentioned the wild eye tv which is going to be showcasing a little bit something a little bit different than what we've showed in the past not just wildlife but also a lot of um, lifestyle videos for you guys to enjoy. For Wild Eye TV, what would your ultimate place or activity be to film? <laughs> okay, so I love this question from Jerry and him and I have actually had quite a few whiskeys over the last two weeks discussing all of these things and um, it's been a lot of excitement for, for all of us, I think for, for where this will go for the possibilities that's out there. I'm not going to share too much about uh, the ideas that we have going around because you guys might steal it. Um, but to answer the question, I think, I mean, th th there's a lot of lodges and things, uh, a lot of cities, Cape Town, international trips. But something that I look forward to most and something that I really want to bring in is a feel-good part of the Wildlife TV. So... Now, if we're doing something like Cape Town, for example, we're doing a road trip to eventually get to a stage where we can have a PayPal account and help people along the way on our journey. This might be for anyone to, it, it might be a person that you can see is struggling. They're li literally putting in fuel just to get to their next destination to say, listen, we'll fill up your tank for you. Or it might be, you know, someone on the side of the road that's obviously hungry, that doesn't have shoes or clothes, to then be able to, you know, buy groceries for them and, you know, just to give them food on the table or whatever it may be. And it's, it's not a thing to, I think, to get self-recognition. I think it's just something that I've personally wanted to do for, a, for quite a long time. I've done it like small scale within Johannesburg. But to be able to have that opportunity to do it on a larger scale, to make a difference, is something that I really want to be part of. Um, I think that that, that feel-good moment, uh, I think that everyone needs during, during this time especially. I think also, you know, if, if, we can, if we can make people smile, can make people laugh, and can make people cry maybe if it's tears of happiness, um, I think that is something that I really want to do. You know, whether it be someone that wakes up in the States and sees the, the wildlife TV episode and it brings that smile on their face or someone in South Africa at the end of the day that you might have had a rough day and this just brings a smile on your face again. I think that for me would be the, the ultimate is to, yeah, to make people laugh and to make people enjoy what's around them again. I think that's, that's so important. So yeah, th there's, there's a lot of things to be excited about. We're going to be sharing this journey with you guys every Wednesday. And yeah, the possibilities with this is absolutely endless. If you want to get involved with something like that, if you want to get involved with, like, like I mentioned, these feel-good moments, please get in touch again. My email is going to be at the end of this episode. Let's have a conversation. Let's chat. And let's make this happen. 
Guys, thank you so much again for sending your questions through. That's episode 60. That's a wrap. Um, next week, as I mentioned, Jerry and myself will be co-hosting again. And we look forward to answering any of the questions that you might possibly have. Like I mentioned as well, if you have any questions about Wildlife TV, that's something new that we're offering, please give us a shout. Um, we'd love to answer any questions that you guys might have or any suggestions that you guys might have for us. Maybe things you want to see, places you want us to go to, please let us know. But yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you guys again next week. Cheers for now.